Welcome to this latest installment of Breaking Down Barriers, where today we're going to be speaking about something that has not really been talked about in the HD community, and that's called an expanded access program. And so here with me today to shed light on that are two amazing people. First of all, uh, Lauren Holder, who is one of of our HDYO ambassadors. She's also a part of, um, of Help for HD Live and a, and a known advocate, especially in the US. And of course, Hank Schering, who's a part of the Polenia team to talk a little bit about um, their perspective of expanded access. But I'd love for them to uh, be able to introduce themselves. So I'll start off with Hank. Thank you, Jenna. Uh, thank you all and uh, welcome to this session. Uh, I'm very thrilled to speak about expanded access. And I think it is an important topic for the community. I'm currently uh, Chief Regulatory and Commercialization Officer at Prelenia. Prior to Prelenia, I have been working in rare diseases for about uh, over 20 years at Gentime and Sanofi Gentime in the areas of regulatory and uh, commercial. And I've been especially intrigued and involved in bringing first treatments to indications where no approved treatments were available. Thanks so much for being here today, Hank, and uh, just a little bit of experience within this topic <laughs> that you're bringing to the table. Uh, Lauren, would you like to? Yeah, <laughs> Lauren, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, absolutely. And thank you so much for having me today. I'm really excited to be part of this discussion. Um, so I'm Lauren Holder. I'm the producer and host of Help for HD Live, which is the first ever podcast created for the HD community by the HD community. Um, I'm also a member of the HD community advisory board, um, whose mission is to represent the voice of the global HD community and provide HD community experience to regulators, industry, researchers, and governing bodies. Um, I also serve on the Patient Advocacy Advisory Council for the Institute for Gene Therapies, and as Jenna mentioned, I'm an HDO ambassador. Um, I got involved in the HD community after my grandfather was diagnosed with the disease um, and got heavily involved. So I, I did uh, patient advocacy, education, and awareness, um, and all my efforts led to receiving awards. Um, in 2014, HDSA Person of the Year, and then in 2022, Help for HD Voice for Change. Um, I was also a caregiver for my father after he was diagnosed with HD, um, and I literally stopped all of my efforts to take care of him starting in 2015 until he passed in January of 2021. Um, and so now I uh, spend my time fighting by joining other advocates in the community to raise awareness about the urgency felt within the gene positive pre-symptomatic subgroup of people with HD um, for effective treatments and their willingness to take on the risk of participating in clinical trials in order to accelerate HD research. You can see two pretty big heavy hitters when it comes to advocacy and, and uh, advocacy for the HD community and other rare diseases. So thank you, Lauren. Thank you, Hank, for being here today. Hank, I'm going to pick on you again really quickly. Um, some people in our community haven't had the chance to meet you yet, so I'd love to know a little bit about what made you get started in HD. I'll keep it short, as I could have a very long answer. Uh, but the, if you look throughout uh, my career and my life, I've always had a huge interest in neurology and a huge interest in rare diseases, and especially in getting treatments available to patients when there is no treatment available for those diseases. I think it is even more important to work on that uh, than others. So how did I get involved in Huntington disease? Uh, I think the easiest way to say is that by time at Gentime, I started looking at Huntington disease. And then in 2020, I heard about predopidine. And after hearing about predopidine, I got very excited about the potential of an orally administered small molecule that can pass the blood-brain barrier and get to the areas of the brain that are relevant for Huntington disease. So when I heard about it, uh, I connected with Dr. Michael Hayden, our CEO, and after talking to him, I got very excited and decided to leave Genzyme, son of Genzyme, after the 21 years and make myself uh, help Prelenia further with pedopidine. And that has been a very satisfying work so far, and we hope to bring it even further. 
Awesome. Thanks for sharing a little bit about that. It's just nice to get to know one another, especially for young people to understand um, the the many investments that people working in, in science and research have within the community itself and, and what inspired them to join. So thank you so much. Um, now let's jump into this topic because it is um, a little bit of a challenging topic. It's a new topic for a lot of us, but Hank, I'm wondering if you could simply share what is an expanded access program or EAP, as you may hear us calling it um, for short, and then what role does it play within the clinical trial process itself, which by itself can be really challenging to understand? So to put it very simple, expanded access program, the word says it already, it is an expanded access. And what it basically does in case of serious life-threatening diseases, allow for a pathway for early access for patients that cannot participate in clinical trials. So it is not a replacement, it is an addition. You will have seen quite often that a clinical trial has eligibility criteria or inclusion and exclusion criteria. And then some patients may not meet those criteria and then they cannot participate in the study. And for some of them, it may be very important to get early access to treatment. And that is where expanded access or sometimes called compassionate use can come into play. And that is where companies can set up programs to allow early access under certain conditions to patients in need. So when you're thinking of the clinical trial process, does this usually happen um, towards the end through a transition or what, what within that clinical trial process leads a company to kind of lean a little bit more on, on offering expanded access? So often companies will want to have an understanding of the product and whether it works or not, because you want to make sure that you have an anticipation that there will be a positive benefit risk, as they call it, so that you understand that the product will be relatively safe for that patient mm -hmm. and that you can expect benefits for that patient. And that is the assessment to be made. So generally, this happens more in the phase clinical phase two slash phase three trial area and not in phase one. Right. I think that's kind of helpful as we continue as a community to understand more about what happens um, in those many different phases of clinical trials as it, it is really an onion that continues to be peeled off to further understand the different layers of that. Yeah, correct. And in well, many cases, companies will try to do this to find a way to allow for patients that cannot participate in the trial. Because what you try to do in a clinical trial is to get a kind of homogeneous population where you anticipate the effect. And if you miss out on the clinical eligibility criteria and you cannot join, there may still be reasons why early access would be relevant and important. Yeah, I think this is a very interesting concept and, and point, especially for young people, as they may not be, um, as many are not eligible because of those inclusion criteria because of the onset of symptoms not taking place quite yet. Lauren, I'm curious, as a member of the HD community, why did you want to have this conversation with us? Um, I think it's I think it's a really important conversation. Um, you know, one of the things that I hate to say this as somebody that's part of the HD community, but one of the things that I notice uh, is we tend to be more more reactive and less proactive when it comes to learning this stuff and then we tend to scramble right when things come up and so i think it's important to have these conversations about what these programs are what resources are available to us um, and i also think it's important to remember like it gives us another option in research um, and so i it, it's a very important thing for those who feel like they they are stuck because they can't participate in clinical trials but here they are dying from something and they want to do something and it, it gives them another option and that um, empowers people and it, it truly helps the community. Yes, I agree because we always believe just general knowledge is, is power and can be an empowering um, factor as you're deciding things on. But it's also, it's, it's, it's exciting to be able to know that if certain treatments get to that point to where they're, they're either transitioning in phases, they can see a benefit and they want to offer that to more patients. It is a really, um, can be really exciting for the community to hear who maybe can't participate. Oh, absolutely. I mean, you know, when you hear that something uh, like, like what Prolenia has, where it, it did show benefit in, in a certain 
um, population and you know that it could and then to know that at least while we're working towards things there's this option for those who can't participate in the clinical trial i mean that's awesome um it, it helps to kind of give us that hope that you know we're moving in the right direction and we're still able to to really help mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe to add one additional thing there, um, we are especially doing uh, this at this moment for patients that have been so supportive with their caregivers in our clinical trial. So those patients that were part of Proof HD and the open label extension will have the possibility for continued access to predopidine mm -hmm. after the trial has ended through this expanded access compassionate use possibility across the globe. So that will not only be in the US, but also the Canadian patients as well as the European patients. Yeah, it's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for adding that to it. I know you 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 chatted a little bit about how this fits within the clinical trial process and some of the goals with understanding um, further benefit with having um, more patients involved. But I'm curious when um, a company starts to design their clinical trials, is this something that they think about at the beginning or is it a hope or is it more of an afterthought if certain things arise? Um, just curious kind of how that fits in with the initial thoughts of how a clinical trial is going to function. I think every company will have a different approach there. Uh, and, and part of my approach, part of the Prelenia approach and part of the approach that I'm used to comes from my uh, career in rare diseases. I think my personal opinion there is that if you develop and you go into clinical trials in diseases like Huntington disease or other genetic rare diseases, it is almost, yeah, you almost need to, from the start, think about this possibility because you will end up with patients that cannot participate in the clinical trial, but for whom waiting until an approval may take too long and still will be in a need. And I think if you look to FDA, they recognize this because many of these diseases will qualify for what is called a fast track development. And in case you have a fast track development, FDA will require you to have your policy about expanded access compassionate use on your website. So anybody who's interested can then look to the website and can see what are the criteria, can see the program and how that is being handled within a company. Mm -hmm. I think that's really important. And, and again, just to kind of reiterate that expanded access is for a treatment that has not yet been approved by a regulatory agency. So just this is kind of early access, if you will, but expanded past the actual clinical trial participants. Just yeah. want to remind you of that. And maybe to add sometimes also for diseases for or indications for which it is not yet approved. So the product can be approved, mm. but then it can also be considered for another indication. It is in mm. all cases for a high unmet need, chronic debilitating life-threatening disease for which currently no real good treatment would be available and where there is a perceived benefit risk that is positive for that patient. Yeah, that's a great addition. Thanks for adding that in there because that's important to understand. Um, thinking a little bit about some of the logistics is how much does it cost for a patient to participate in an EAP? So that's a very good question and also a tricky question because mm -hmm. this can be different per country and can be different uh, per expanded access program. So uh, we, for example, choose to make predopidin free for the patients in the post-trial expanded access. However, companies can decide to talk to FDA and be allowed to charge for it. The other part of this discussion is, of course, at a clinical trial site or hospital where the patient is being treated, because there are also costs associated with the treatment. So often companies try to keep the treatment in an expanded access as close as possible to what is the normal standard of care to minimize the cost. And there can be discussions uh, about how to share costs or how to handle additional costs for patients. But the key is that many companies will strive towards patients not having to pay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's obviously a huge benefit as that's a big factor. Yeah. yeah. Uh, can a patient bring this up with their doctor as, as an option? And if so, when should they be having this conversation? So a patient can bring this up with their doctor. Um, 
if you look to our policy on the website, we only accept it if the question comes from a qualified doctor. So it has to be a doctor who comes up with the question. Patients who feel that they uh, need something can always have a discussion with their doctor and then uh, talk to the doctor about why they want it, what is their situation, uh, and then the doctor can submit a request. The request will be assessed at the company level by qualified people, and then there will be a uh, discussion and a decision. It is not guaranteed that every request will be accepted and validated. Mm -hmm. Yep, so you can't just walk up to a pharmacy or your or general practitioner and say, I heard this is happening. But a good point is to utilize your your system of supporters <clears throat> to figure out who those qualified physicians might be if if wanting to participate. Yeah, and if you look at our website, you will see the type of criteria. It's about the disease. Uh, it has to be chronic mm -hmm. debilitating. It has to be something where we have enough data on safety and efficacy. And mm -hmm. it also has to be uh, an expected positive benefit risk for the patient. And lastly, mm -hmm. it, logistically, it has to be feasible because it's not always possible in every country in the world to get a product there uh, for these type of situations. Mm -hmm. Thinking a little bit again about this transition, excuse me, transition of clinical trial participation and the, the, the different complexities of what they're participating in and then how that moves into an expanded access program. Does are the participants of the EAP getting the same doses of the investigational uh, treatment, or how does that compare oftentimes between clinical trials dosage and and then what the EAP participants get? It's a great question, and I think there are multiple scenarios there. Um, and I, I'm going to put this in the in the bigger picture. So for adults, and in the post-trial access, in the plan uh, expanded access, we are discussing for predopidine. That's exactly the same dose as they had during the trial. So twice a day, one capsule of predopidine. What sometimes is needed if you go to other groups, like let's talk about HCYO and pediatric patients, sometimes you cannot give the same dose in pediatric patients and you would have to do a dose adjustment to get to the same level. And that could be that you need a lower dose to get to the same exposure levels to support the same type of efficacy. Now, I'm going to grill you on this because you said pediatric. Is is this expanded access specifically for prolenia for over 18-year-olds? Or is there um, anything you, you can say about maybe... You right out of my mouth, Jennifer. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's another great question. So the current expanded access that we have set up is... Uh, an expanded access for post-trial access. We will be looking into further expanding this um, in, the, in the coming months to also new naive patients. And as many people that are listening now may remember, uh, we have a pediatric investigation plan approved as part of the European regulatory process. We are in the stages of finding ways to finish the non-clinical toxicity. So this toxicity studies in animals to support pediatric use. And once we know that, uh, we will have to look at what would be the right dose in pediatric patients, but then certainly uh, an opportunity could come up also for pediatric patients, as I think in many ways they would meet the criteria as on our website. I had to just strike on that since it was mentioned. So thank you for clarifying that because I know even um, we talked a little bit about that previously as well. Um, so you mentioned this a little bit earlier about the the two different terms, expanded access and compassionate use. Can you break that down a little bit about what some of those differences are? Let's Let me break it down from a US perspective because I think that is the easiest way. Uh, generally, when we talk about expanded access on the U.S. side, we talk about a sponsor like Prelenia, who have a protocol in place that you can find uh, that is approved by FDA with certain criteria that allows for this use. If you talk about compassionate use, it is more specific to an individual patient for which the doctor requests this approval to FDA. And I think that's the easiest way to explain it. So compassionate use is generally one to a few patients. Expanded access is when it is a uh, larger number of patients. 
Yeah, that's, that's great. Thanks for thanks for that clarification. Um, Lauren, I, I'm interesting. I'm interested to know what did you know about expanded access before this conversation, and do you think that the community fully understands what this means? Um, I I had a basic knowledge, just very basics of um, EAP. Um, this has definitely been enlightening for me. Um, and no, I don't. I really don't feel like the community is aware of this and what it means and how it could benefit us. I mean, this is this is a big deal, um, especially because you're you're not just looking at uh, the adult onset, but in the future, you know, hopefully JHD, and that's that's huge for our community um, to to have a, an expanded access program. Um, so yeah, it's very exciting. On, on the pediatric, think? I will so, give a little bit of the caveat. As I said, we still need to establish the dose. Sure, yeah. But yeah. Uh, yes, uh, it is a future opportunity. Absolutely true. I think it's just important for the community to understand that the scientific community is investing in, in pediatric populations with HD because you don't always get to hear about it because there are so many different regulatory things that you have to watch out for and compliance and making sure that you're not um, creating false hope or promises, but just even the sheer fact of understanding that the JHD population is is being looked at, I think is really important for families. It's, I mean, it really is. I mean, they just don't want to be forgotten. And so to even know like, yes, that's not there yet, but mm -hmm. it is something that's being thought about is just, I mean, that's important because I think a lot of times they feel forgotten. So, um, I, I think it's great that uh, that there is this plan in place, and um, it's very exciting to to talk about EAP and actually know like what the next steps are. Well, thinking again, while we're while we're still considering the community aspect of it, would love each of you to share a little bit about your opinion on why the community needs to know more about these types of things and specifically expanded access. Um, I'm going to start with Hank. So why do you think this is important for the community? I think it's important for the community to appreciate that with more products moving in the clinical program to phase three, uh, and I sincerely hope that in the future we will see more programs getting to that level, and patients not being eligible for a clinical study, that that doesn't necessarily mean that they may not have access to these type of treatments early if there is a high need. Uh, I think if you look to ALS, for example, the community has been very strong in asking companies to support this, uh, setting up NIH funded expanded access programs. And I think there are lessons to be learned from other diseases that could also apply to Huntington, which still is a high unmet need. So there is an urgency. And for me, the fact that you have an disease like Huntington doesn't mean that you cannot have access to a treatment when you are in need. So making the community aware that there are options outside clinical trials under certain conditions is probably as important as explaining what a clinical trial is, which clinical trials are ongoing. And we are getting into uncharted territory because we will see more programs towards phase three. We hopefully will see programs moving to a, submissions at various regulatory authorities. And in that context, this is an important topic for patients to know and understand. And for the international community, it gets a little bit challenging because oftentimes um, these different designations and focus tend to be US and, and European. Um, just quickly, Hank, I'm curious, to my knowledge, many times, what gets decided in FDA and, and EMA, it usually encourages other national regulatory agencies to really take a look at what's going on to see if that can be offered in their country. Is that a fair statement? Uh, if you talk about compression reduced uh, expanded access, yes. And let me okay. bring it back to the post-trial access we are doing. So our mm -hmm. clinical trial proof HD was in US, Canada, and I think nine European countries, and we are supporting with the authority support in all these 11 countries expanded access for those post-trial patients. And mm -hmm. they may have different names. They may not call it expanded access. It may be called compassionate use. It may have early access. Uh, 
but many countries have national legislation in place to allow support for these type of situations. Mm -hmm. And I think it's, as Lauren mentioned, and as Hank has mentioned too, it's a great opportunity for advocacy as well. So in those countries that don't tend to be represented in clinical trials for a number of different reasons, um, this is another important point that as you're seeing news that are happening in other countries to be able to say, we need this in our country and this is why. And I think those are really important steps. Absolutely. Lauren, your thoughts on why this is important to the community? I mean, I 100% agree with Hank on this. And um, I also think, you know, what we tend to forget is we look at eligibility criteria, which tends to be broad, right? We When we go and look online, um, but a lot of times we don't qualify for something or we're not eligible based off of other medical conditions or a medication we're taking or things like that. And this truly helps those who are um, either too far along for a clinical trial or um, don't meet the criteria for the clinical trial um, to be able to, to get something and to have that option and still feel like they're part of it and they're, they still matter um, because they do. And, uh, and so it's, it's something that gives hope and it empowers the community um, because there's this other option, um, you know, and I, I will be very excited to see others um, kind of do the same thing if we if we do see that. Um, I sure hope so. Um, but I love that Prolenia has really taken the lead on this and really showed, you know, how to do it for the HD community. Um, and, uh, you know, the other part of it that I think about is for those who begin in a clinical trial and as they progress, they no longer meet criteria or, um, you know, they they literally get to a point where they're just, they can't do it anymore physically, whatever it is. And to be able to say, okay, well, there's this expanded access program where you can still participate um, and take this to hopefully, you know, help you even though, you know, you, you can't participate any longer. Because um, I think we forget about the fact that a lot of these clinical trials take years, right? And years for us, there's a lot that changes. So um, it's just a really great um, option for us to have. And I think, Hank, for those who want to know exactly what's happening in Pelenia about the expanded access program, because it sounds like you're really focusing specifically on trial participants to start and then and then potentially moving from there. Is that, a, is that uh, fair to say, just as a reminder? So it's it's not like uh, it's it's open right now for everybody in the community to start asking questions about it, but it's a good first stop. So how can people find out more? Uh, we will continue to talk to uh, the patient advocacy groups, including HCYO, on uh, next steps. But there is also on our website, if you go to our website, you will be able to find our policy on expanded access, which clearly explains what is needed and also explains that it has to be a request from the treating physician. Who, and if you have any questions, start with that discussion with your treating physician. Yeah, for for really those important. who don't go to, um, you know, who don't go to maybe an HD specialist or center of excellence, you know, do you have a suggestion on on to how to go about talking to their doctor about that? That's a great question, and um, and I would say we don't we say qualified physician, so it doesn't have to be an HCSA center of excellence specialist. It has to be somebody who's medically qualified to support the request. Okay. Yes, I think looking up that criteria is important, but I also encourage anybody, um, anybody in the HD community and anybody in general to always seek for second opinions and to build a team of doctors who support you because that's, to me, the best the best thing and, and have those discussions with your clinicians to say, you know, these are my ultimate goals and um, I really need you to help me get there. Um, whether you're interested in participating in trials or have different advocacy needs or different family needs. Um, and if you find a doctor who's not willing to help meet those goals, I think it's it's okay to find someone else. Don't ever feel guilty about um, about getting those different opinions to find a good team around you. Yeah, and I would also say, you know, uh, take the information with you, right? Like take a packet of information that includes 
not only the forum, but information on Perlenia and what's going on and things like that. Because a lot of times if you don't go to a, a neurologist who's an HD expert, or if you don't go to a center of excellence and they have no clue what's going on, you're going to have to educate. Um, and so be prepared with information. Well, Lauren, I'm curious, what are your takeaways from this? Um, I, I mean, I'm, I'm, my takeaway is just that it's a, an exciting option, right? Like this is something that um, is very exciting. And I, and I really hope that we see, uh, see it done in other clinical trials. Um, and, you know, I just love having another option. I love that there's something like this that can can help to provide a little bit more hope and a little bit more quality of life um, and, and empower in a different way because of having the option. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you so much for both of you being here today. This is a really important topic um, and I'd love to leave it open for any closing remarks that, that either of you have um, as we wrap up today. My only closing remark would be, Jenna, uh, for people to keep talking, keep asking. And if there are further questions, uh, feel free to reach out either to HCYO or to me for, for, uh, mm -hmm. in case of questions. And I say this all the time, when you're going to HD events, talk to the scientific community because they need to hear your voices. And um, I think sometimes it can be intimidating, but crossing that emotional barrier barrier of making that first stop to having those conversations is really helpful because then you can understand your perspectives, what questions you have, how to better address that to the community. So if you see Hank at a meeting, he's very tall and he'll be happy to talk with you. <laughs> Lord, any other closing thoughts? Um, I just want to say uh, thank you, Hank, and to Perlenia in general, just, you know, for continuing to show that you guys are about the patient, right? And you you are constantly thinking about the patients and participants and um, what you can do uh, in the meantime until we get to a point of actual FDA approval. So um, thank you for that. Thank you. I'm very happy, pleased to hear that uh, we are known for our patient centricity because that is a, a key aspect for me, at least personally, and for Prelenia to do. Absolutely. Awesome. Well, thank you both so much for your time, sharing your insights, your information, um, feelings, all of that good stuff. And it's an important conversation. And this is just the beginning of the conversation. So we'll continue to keep the community updated on, on what's happening at Prelenia with different expanded access programs and continue to have these different topics to help educate and empower young people and across the globe impacted by HD. So thank you all so much and um, thanks for watching and we'll see you soon. Bye. Take care. Thanks. Take care.